Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing well. And if you're new here on this channel, I'll be doing IGCSC physics related content. So I'll be doing past paper questions, topic questions and overall revision. So if you're interested, make sure to subscribe so you would not miss any upcoming content. So in this video, I'll be going through IGCSE physics paper four for the October November series of 2023. I'm going to go through variant 42. So stay tuned. So let's start with the first question. A car accelerates uniformly in a straight line from rest at time zero. At time 3.2 seconds, the speed of the car is 13 meters per second. Calculate the acceleration of the car. So as we know, acceleration is going to be the change in speed over change in time. So our final speed is going to be 13 meters per second minus our initial speed is going to be zero as they've told us it starts from rest and our time is going to be 3.2 seconds so that would just be 13 divided by 3.2 that would give us 4.1 meters per second squared that's going to be our answer part two explain in words what is meant by the term acceleration so acceleration is the rate of change of velocity of velocity this is the definition of acceleration part b the car travels at 13 meters per second from time 3.2 seconds to time 12 seconds plot the speed time graph for the car from t0 to t12 so from t0 to t12 so in the previous statement they have told us that the car uniformly accelerates until time 3.2 so time 3.2 would be somewhere around here so this is 2.4 2.8 this is, would be 3.2. So now we would draw a straight line connecting 0, 0. So it starts from the origin and it's going to be a line. But then this line should stop at time 3.2 seconds and also at speed 30 meters per second. So let me just draw the point. So 3.2, it goes up somewhere under until 13. So now we draw a straight line connecting from the origin. This is the first part of the graph and it shows that it uniformly accelerates. And then on the part B, they've told us it travels at 13 meters per second until time, until time 12. So we would stop around here and it would be a straight horizontal line as the speed is constant. So a straight line over here. That's going to be our graph. Determine the distance traveled by the car between time zero and time 3.2 second. So, so now we have this triangle. And this is a speed time graph. So the distance is going to be the area under that region. So we just have to find the area of this triangle. So the base is 3.2. And the height is going to be 13. So it's going to be half base times height. It's going to be half of 3.2 times 13. So that would give us 20.8 meters. Don't forget the units. Part C. The car decelerates from... 13 meters per second to zero at a constant deceleration. The mass of the car is 1,350 kilograms and the car travels 
13 meters in 2 seconds as it decelerates. Show that the work done by the car as it decelerates is approximately 1.1 times to the power of 5 joule. So this basically means 100, 111,000. So first and foremost, we know that work done is equals to force times distance. So they've given us a distance, which is 13. So work done is going to be force times 13. So now to find the force, we have the formula force equals mass times acceleration. So the mass is going to be 1350. And we have the acceleration or the deceleration which now we have to calculate. So to quickly find acceleration, it's the final velocity minus initial over the time. So the final velocity is going to be zero because it decelerates and the initial is going to be 13 over time, which is two seconds. So this would give us 6.5 meters per second squared actually a minus 6.5 but then the minus just indicates that it's in the opposite direction so it's not that significant so 1350 times 6.5 that's our force so that would give us 8775 that's our force so we'll plug this force into this equation over here so the work done is equals to 8775 times 13 that should give us 114,075, which is approximately equal to 1.1 times 10 to the power of 5, if we round it to two significant figures. So there you have it. We have proven it. Part D. On another day, the car in C travels a longer distance while it decelerates from 13 to 0. The deceleration is constant. Suggest and explain what causes the stopping distance to increase. So for this question, we just have to use logic here. So one of the suggestions can be that the brakes of the car are worn out. of the car are worn out and what it, this means is that there would be less friction res resisting the force so it would take more time to stop the car so it would be less friction so more time would be required time is required to stop the car That could be one of the answers. Let's move on to question number two. Figure 2.1 shows an electric tumble dryer used to dry with cloth. So over here we have the image and the parts labeled. Part A, hot air blows into the drum. So this is the drum over here. Hot air blows into here and then the air gains The air gains water vapor from the clothes and then leaves the drum. The moist air enters the condenser. Cool air leaves the condenser, passes through the heating element and enters the drum again. So basically what it, it is describing is we have wet clothes over here. And then what happens is we have hot air passing into the drum. And then as hot air passes, the water from the wet clothes evaporates. And as it evaporates, it's in vapor form, so it can pass through this hole over here, and then it would travel down to the to a condenser. So in the condenser, it would turn back into liquid water, and then it would be stored into this container over here. And then the process starts again with the heater over here, and then air passes through the heater, so it's going to be hot air, and the process repeats itself. Part one, state the process 
by which the hot air removes water from wet clothes. This one simple. It's evaporation. As the water in the clothes evaporates because of the hot air and the high temperature. Part two. The air is cooled as it passes through the condenser, like I've mentioned earlier. Describe and explain one other way in which the air leaving the condenser is different from the air entering the condenser. So the way they're mentioning is like it's cooler. So one other way it's different from. So it could be that the air is drier. The air is drier because the water vapor has condensed or the water has been removed from the air. So what we have is just dry air. So we can say the water vapor has condensed or has been removed. That's why the air is drier. Part B. The drum of the tumble dryer rotates, lifting up the wet clothes, which then fall down through the hot air. Name the force that causes the clothes to fall down. This one is gravitational force, because anything that causes an object to fall down is gravitational force. Gravitational force. Part 2. When the drum rotates too fast, the clothes remain in contact with the wall of the drum. State the direction of the resultant force on the clothes during the circular motion. So let me let me try to draw it. So they specifically specified that it's in a circular motion. So how the cloth would be traveling would be in a circle. So at Whenever we're looking at circular motion, the resultant force is always to the center. So at this point, let's say the cloth is moving in this direction. At the resultant force is at the center. And at this point, the cloth is moving in this direction. So the resultant force is also at the center. And at this point, the cloth would be moving in this direction. Yet the resultant force would be at the center. So from this, we can see that all this are perpendicular. So we can write that the force is perpendicular to the motion of the cloth. Motion of the clothes. That would be our answer. Suggest so why using a clothes line to dry clothes in the open air is better for the environment than using an electric tumble dryer. So what they're saying is they're providing an alternate option. So we can have like maybe two poles and then the clothes can be over here hanged. And they're asking why this method is better than the other one to dry clothes. So one of them could be it. this method would use wind and heat energy from the sun or solar power. Or solar energy so we can say this method uses solar and wind energy which are renewable so this is one way in which this method is better question three a balloon of mass 15 grams is glued to a straw. The straw is threaded into onto a horizontal string as shown in figure 3.1. The balloon is filled with air and then air is released. Okay. As the air leaves the balloon, the balloon experiences a force. The balloon accelerates from rest until it reaches a constant speed. Let's remember the constant speed. It travels 0 0.67 meters and 0 0.18 seconds at this constant speed. Explain in word what is meant by the term 
impulse. So impulse is basically force times time. This is the simplest form of impulse. And now this time is the time in which the object is in contact with the object acting a force on it. Calculate the resultant impulse on the balloon while it's accelerating. Now, the other formula for impulse is that impulse, which is force times time, is equal to the change in momentum. This formula we can use. So, we're asked to find the impulse. So, to find the change in momentum, what we can do is we know that the balloon is at rest at first. So the, the initial momentum, I mean the final momentum would be zero. So momentum is going to be mass times velocity. So our mass is 15 grams. So to convert that into kilograms, we just divide by 1000 and we'd get 0 0.015 kgs. That's our mass and velocity. So to find velocity, it's distance over time. So the distance is given 0 0.67. The time is also given 0 0.18. So our velocity would be 3.72. So the mass is 0 0.015, 0 0.015 times 3.72. So that would give us 0 0.056 Newton seconds. That's going to be our answer. How I go Newton seconds is impulse is force times time. So Newton times seconds. That's the unit for impulse. If any of you were wondering. Part three. Explain the explain how momentum is conserved as a balloon accelerates. So to answer this question, let's dive deeper into what happens to the balloon when it's released. So here we have the balloon. And then it's tied over here. And then it's released at some point. So that, that means air would be moving out. So the balloon would be moving in this direction. And air would be and moving in the opposite direction. So, and this causes the balloon to move forward as the air is moving backwards. The magnitude of the momentum of the magnitude of the air is equals to the magnitude of the balloon. So they're acting in opposite direction, but their magnitude is the same. So that means momentum is conserved. So we can say as air is released from the balloon, it moves in the opposite direction, in the opposite direction, and the momentum of air is equals to that of the balloons. In magnitude. So that's going to be our answer. Part B. Figure 3.2 shows the direction of two forces acting on a different balloon as it moves. Determine the magnitude and direction of the resultant force on the balloon. This is four marks. Okay. So they've clearly indicated that this is 90 degrees. So over here, we're looking at vector diagrams. So on vector diagrams, the first thing you want to do is going to be connect the head to the tail. So that means, let's say this is our 
0 0.4 newton force so the head should connect like this so it's going to be 0 0.74 over here and the resultant force would be acting in this direction so we can use pythagoras theorem here to find the hypotenuse so it's going to be 0 0.74 squared plus 0 0.4 squared would be let's say resultant force is f squared so we just square root both sides so f would give us 0 0.74 squared plus 0 0.4 squared and then root of that which gives us 0 0.84 newtons that's the magnitude so magnitude is 0 0.84 and now the direction relative to the horizontal force so I'll, what this basically means is this angle over here to the horizontal force so now to find this angle we have the one adjacent to it and we have the one opposite to it so we can use tan since tan is opposite over adjacent so we can call this theta so tan theta is equals to the opposite is 0 0.74 over 0 0.4 sorry about that so 0 0.74 over 0 0.4 That would give us 61.6 degrees. That's the direction to the horizontal force. So that's how you can easily get these four marks. Question number four. Figure 4.1 shows a bottle, part filled with water. The air inside the bottle is at the same pressure as the outside the bottle. Okay, okay. The bottle and its contents are at room temperature. The temperature of the bottle and its contents are increased. Explain in terms of particles how the air pressure inside the bottle changes as the temperature increases. Three marks over here. Okay, so the first one is as the temperature increases, the kinetic energy increases. So as temperature increases the kinetic energy also increases that means if they are moving at a higher speed they would have more frequent collisions so the particles would have more frequent Sorry about my bad handwriting. Collisions. And for our third point, we can write the molecules would collide with a higher force. Collide with a higher force. Those are our three points. Part two, the lid is removed from the bottle. State and explain how the air pressure in the bottle changes. So the pressure decreases. This is because, okay, let me try to draw it. So we have our bottle over here. And when it's opened, air starts flowing out. So that means the pressure decreases. So the pressure decreases because air flows out. But then it continues to decrease until the pressure inside is equal to the pressure outside. So it continues to decrease. until pressure inside 
is equals to pressure outside. That is our answer. Part B. The mass of water in the bottle is 0 0.8 in kgs. The specific heat capacity of water is 4200. Calculate the thermal energy needed to increase the temperature of the water by 20 degrees Celsius. So we have the formula Q equals MC, change in T. Q represents the thermal energy, M is the mass, C is the specific heat capacity, and this is the change in temperature. So just substitute 0 0.18, but the specific heat capacity is given in Joule, okay, yeah, it's okay, it's okay, times 4,200 times 20. So that should give us Fifteen thousand one twenty. That's going to be our answer in joules. Part C. Another plastic bottle is filled to the top with water. The height of the bottle is forty centimeters. The density of the water is one thousand kilograms per meter cubed. Calculate the pressure be difference between the top and the bottom of the water. So the pressure difference is equals to the density times gravity times the difference in height. So at the top and at the bottom. So that means if this is our bottle, this distance is going to be 40 centimeters. So we have to convert this 40 centimeters into meters first because our density is in meters cubed, so we just divide this by 100, that would give us 0 0.4, so the density is 1000 times 9.8 times 0 0.4, so that would give us 1000 times 9 times 0 0.4, 3920, that's our pressure difference in Pascals. Question 5. Figure 5.1 shows a road junction, a moving car, and a stationary truck. The road has high walls on each side. Okay, good to know. A. The driver of the truck is at position X. The car moves around the corner on figure 5.1. Label a point Y on the road where the truck driver first sees the car. So let's try to imagine the vision of the truck driver. So he would be able to see somewhere until here. So the truck driver would see the car around here and just label it Y. Part B. A plane mirror is placed at the road junction at the shown in figure. Show how this mirror allows the driver of the truck to see the car when it's at the position shown in figure 5.2. So what they're saying is with this mirror in place, the truck driver can see the car from its position. The car doesn't have to come over here like on the previous part. So what we can do is we draw light rays. So we're going to have a light ray from the car. Something like that. Let me just redraw that. We have light rays from the car. And then this light ray would be reflected into the driver's vision. So through the mirror, he can see the car from its position. Part C. The truck driver wears spectacles to correct long sightedness. Figure 5.3 shows how a blurred image how a blurred image of an object all forms on the retina. 
any effect of cornea on the rays of light can be ignored. Okay, okay. On figure 5.4, show how long sightedness is corrected by adding a suitable lens in front of the eye. Continue the paths of the three light rays until they meet to form an image. So for, for an image to be formed, this three rays must meet at the retina over here. But then as you can see here, if we continue the drawing, they would meet behind the retina, somewhere around here. So that means the driver would have like a blurred vision. So, but because of this lens, they would diverge earlier. So that means we can draw straight line, but they would diverge. And then they would meet at the retina. Sorry about my poor drawing. I'm not using a ruler. Since this rays meet at the retina, that means the image would be formed over here. Oh, sorry about that. I made a slight mistake. So I'm supposed to add a suitable lens in front of the eye. Okay, okay. So what we'd add is a converging lens, something like that, so that the rays would be bent earlier. So it would move straight until here, and then it would be bent. And then it would be bent too. And then it would also be bent. Wait, let me redraw the last one correctly. So when it meets the lens, it would be bent. So the rays would bend early on the first lens and then on the second lens they would bend again so that to make sure they meet on the retina. So that should be the answer. Let's move on to question number six, electricity questions. Yay! Figure 6.1 shows the circuit diagram for a flashlight. The electromotive force of the battery is 4.5 volts. The circuit contains a 60 ohm fixed resistor. The current in the light emitting diode is 0 0.02. Calculate the potential difference across LED. Okay, okay. So we have 4.5 volts. That's the total amount of EMF. And then it will does this, we, the circuit contains 60 ohm fixed resistor and the LED has a, a current of 0 0.02. Calculate the potential difference across the LED. Okay, so this is a series circuit. So we know that the voltage is shared. So if we can find the voltage of the LED, if you can find the voltage across the circuit and subtract it from the total voltage, then we'd find the one at the LED. So voltage is equals to IR. So it's equals to 60 times 0 0.02, which would give us 1.2. So we subtract 4.5, which is the total amount, minus 1.2. That would give us 3.3 volts. So that's the potential difference. Why we're, we're using 0 0.02 amps, even though this is specified for the LED, is because in a series circuit, the current is always the same. So over here, it's 0 0.02. Over here, also, it's 0 0.02. Unlike the voltage, which changes. Explain why the LED does not light up if the battery is reversed. So this, let me redraw it. This allow, allows current flow in only one direction. So it's a semiconductor diode. So it, the LED, I mean, the LED allows current flow in only one direction.
as to which direction it allows is so over here we have the negative so the negative charge it should so the negative charge should come out of this part this is the i believe it's called the cathode so the negative part the negative electrons should come into the cathode and then this should be the positive part otherwise if we reversed it and it's something like this and we have the negative coming through it wouldn't be able to pass or it wouldn't allow current flow okay part c the chemical energy stored in the battery is 1050 joules show that the flashlight operates for approximately three hours so in a circuit the energy we have the formula e equals i v t so i is 0 0.02 v is 4.5 and t is three hours so three hours we have to convert that into seconds actually we do that we're told to prove that it is three hours so we just leave that as t and we have e which is 1050 so we divide both sides by 0 0.02 times 4.5 both sides by 0 0.02 times 4.5 so we have 1050 divided by 0 0.02 times 4.5 that would give us 11,666 seconds this in seconds so to find them in hours we just divide by 3,600 because one hour is 3,600 seconds that would give us 3.2 hours which is approximately equals to 3 hours that's going to be our answer. Calculate the total charge that flows through the LED in 3,600 seconds. Okay, so we have the formula I equals to Q over T. Q is the charge. So I, we have 0 0.02 and then Q over time, which is 3,600. So we just multiply 3,600 times 0 0.02 that would give us 72 coulomb the charge the unit for charge if you are enjoying so far make sure to like and subscribe it would be very appreciated and it would help me a lot let's move on to question 7 figure 7.1 shows some uses of electromagnetic radiation and different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum we have the use on this side and we have the region on this side so we, i think we just have to match them draw a line from each used correct region of spectrum each region of the spectrum is used once one line has been completed for you okay so thermal imaging that's infrared so whenever you have something that has to do with thermal it's infrared photography of people faces so that's light ray or visible light and then this is gamma ray sterilizing medical equipment state the speed of electromagnetic waves in a vacuum so the speed of electromagnetic waves in a vacuum is the same as speed of light which is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second Part C, a Bluetooth headset can be used to listen to music on a mobile phone without the need for wires to connect to the headset to the phone. The headset uses frequencies in the range 2.4 and 2.48 gigahertz. Calculate the wavelengths of the radio wave when the frequency is in the middle of the frequency range. So... On this, we've, to we've, been to we've been told that the frequency should be in the middle of the range. So the middle of 2.4 and 2.48. So that would be 2.44 gigahertz. 
we find that we can just add both of them and then divide by 2. And we have the formula speed equals wavelength times frequency. So if we divide both sides by frequency, we can find the wavelength. So the speed is, as mentioned in the previous question, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 over 2.44 gigahertz. Now giga represents the prefix times 10 to the power of 9. So divided by 2.44 times 10 to the power of 9. So this would give us 0 0.12 meters. So wavelength is 0 0.12 meters. Part 2. Suggest why Bluetooth headset only works well over short distances. So this is because over long distances, they lose energy or they lose signal. So as distance increases, increases, they lose energy or signal, you can say. Let's move on to question number eight. The isotope uranium-235 is represented by this. State what numbers 92-235 represent in this symbol. So the lower number is the proton number, and it represents the number of proton. So 92 is the proton number. And the upper number is always the mass number. And it represents the sum of the proton and neutrons. It's also called the nucleon number. So we can say the mass number. B. Uranium-235 is a fuel used in nuclear reactors. State the process by which energy is released from uranium-235 in a nuclear reactor. So it's called nuclear fission. Not nuclear fusion, nuclear fission. So what happens is a high-speed neutron would attack an unstable uranium atom. So this uranium atom or uranium nucleus, it would split into two, releasing high amounts of energy. Part 2. A nuclide equation for this process is this. Describe the mass and energy change that takes place during the process in a nuclear reactor. So as you can see, we have one nucleus, and then it's broken down into two nucleus with smaller masses. So the nucleus breaks down to two nuclei with smaller masses. And energy is released, so we can say thermal energy is released. CI. Describe how thermal energy from nuclear reactions is used to generate electricity in a power station. So thermal energy from nuclear reaction. So they kind of gave away the answer for the previous question on this question on the next question. So what happens is that the thermal energy would be used. So the thermal energy would be used to heat. to heat water and then steam would be released is released and this steam is going to be at a high pressure so this high pressure steam will drive a turbine Tur turbine and this turbine would is connected to a generator and then it generates electricity so 
a turbine connected to a generator. what generator that is our answer so thermal energy so l let's say we have like water over here and then we have a tube connected for the steam and then at this team we have a turbine forgive my bad drawing so we have thermal energy over here and then the water would boil and steam at high pressure would be released and the turbine starts turning. Now this turbine is connected to a generator which generates electricity. Part 2. State one advantage and one disadvantage of using nuclear fuels in a power station instead of using fossil fuels. So one of the clear advantage is it doesn't release greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and a disadvantage could be that it's it's very dangerous because there could be like a leak of radiation and it's very expensive to build or maintain so I'll go with expensive to build or maintain Let's move on to question number nine. Table 9.1 gives information about three planets in the solar system. So we have Earth, Jupiter, and X. So we have the mass, which is, okay, the masses. And we have the average distance from the sun. So we can see that X is closer to the sun than the Earth. And orbital periods okay so we have the orbital period and the gravitational field strength state the name of planet X so to state the name of X so we have the distance so this distance from the Sun is shorter than that of Earth but then it's not they don't have like a very big difference so it can't be Mer Mercury so it only leaves us with Venus because we have Mercury, Venus, and Earth. So the distance between them is not very big. If it was like a very big difference between the distances, it would have been Mercury. But in this case, it's Venus. Describe the relationship shown in Table 9.1 between the mass of a planet and the gravitational field strength of its surface. So we can say, we can see that a higher mass has higher gravitational field strength so the higher the mass the higher the gravitational field strength that would be answer explain why distance from the sun in table 9.1 is an average value so to answer this question let's look at the orbit of planets so we have the sun over here and the orbit is like elliptical so obviously this distance is not going to be equals to this distance so that's why it's the average distance because the orbit is elliptical, not circular. And not circular. Show that the average orbital speed of the Earth is approximately 30 kilometers per second. Okay. So we have the distance. Average distance from the sun. So let me just remove this part. So if we draw it, if we have the sun and the earth, we know that the earth rotates around the sun so that on average it forms a circle. 
So this this distance is going to be the radius of the circle. So we're asked to find the speed, and then now we have to find the distance first. So the distance is going to be the circumference of the circle. So th circumference is 2 pi r. This is the formula. So the distance is going to be 2 pi r over the time taken. So the time for orbit, we know it's 365.2. But that is in days. So 365.2 days. We have to change that into seconds first. Since the it's given in seconds. So we multiply it by 24. Now it's in hours. And one hour is 3,600 seconds. So we multiply it again by 3,000. 600 so approximately that would give us wait 365.2 times 24 times 3600 that would give us around 35.5 million so we divide that 2 pi r so 2 pi times the radius is 149.6 6, but we can see that it's times 10 to the power of 6 kilometers. So we just have to write times 10 to the power of 6. So 2 pi times 149.6 times 10 to the power of 6. And then all this divided by the time. So that would give us 29.78 kilometers per second. This is approximately equal to 30. So that's how we prove it. Question 10. I think this is the last question. Complete the sentences about the life cycle of a star stars. Protostars are formed from... So in the life cycle of the stars, protostars form from gas and dust. Part B, a protostar becomes a stable star when? So this happens when the inward force is equal to the outward force. So the, the force of gravity, gravitational force, so force of gravitational attraction is balanced by the force due to the high temperature. Force due to high temperature. So what happens in the star is, let's say this is a star. So there would be nuclear fusion happening in the star. So there would be high temperature and there would be forces acting outwards. And then the there is force of gravity which acts inwards. So these forces, when they balance, that means a protostar star becomes a stable star. Part C. The initial fuel used to power nuclear reactions in star is hydrogen. Because a hydrogen molecule uh, nucleus joins with another hydrogen nucleus to form a helium nucleus. That's nuclear fusion, basically. Part D. Stars that are approximately the same size as the sun become red giants. Stars which then form a planetary nebula. So this part is going to be planetary nebula. If you guys would like to, if you'd like me to make a video about the life cycle of a star and all about space physics, make sure to let me know down in the comments and I'll be going through the whole topic and I'll be, I can also go through different to topic questions and how they would like to bring those questions. And for today, that was the last question and I hope you have enjoyed the video and have learned a lot from it. And if you have enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming content. And thank you for watching.